Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen from Vienna, Austria. My name is Benedikt Zanzinger of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation Vienna. Together with our cooperation partner, Atomic Reporters, I'm delighted to welcome you to a new episode of our joint webinar series. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, this online briefing is part of a series of webinars. The purpose of these regularly held webinars is to inform about and discuss important topics related to nuclear disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation. The topic we are covering today is nuclear risk reduction, myths, and realities, which be, will be elaborated by top, top experts in the field. Today's speakers will be introduced by our moderator, Tarek Rauf. Tarek, good afternoon. Good Mr. Afternoon. Rauf is a member of the Board of Directors of Atomic Reporters. He is former head of verification and security policy, alternate head of the NPT delegation at the International Atomic Energy Agency. He was a member of the Eminent Persons Group of Substantive Progress on Nuclear Disarmament, convened by the Foreign Minister of Japan. Before I hand over, I would like to address some technical remarks. This webinar will be recorded as usual and uploaded on our website and on our YouTube channel. Please keep your audio and video sources turned off and please submit the questions and comments through the Q&A function. The moderator will then select or summarize the questions to the speakers and will try to accommodate all questions time permitting. Without, without further ado, I will now hand over to today's moderator, Tariq. Thank you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Benedict, for opening uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, a big hello to everyone in Vienna and elsewhere from me. Today, we've gathered three eminent speakers to speak on a issue of current relevance and importance, nuclear risk reduction, myths and realities. So we've structured the discussion in a way to start with uh, views expressed uh, by Andrei Baklitsky, who is with the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research in Geneva, to in a sense talk about what the thinking is and the research being done in the context of the United Nations and UNIDIR. Followed by Francesca Giovannini, she is the Director of Managing the Atom Project at the Belfast Center at Harvard University to provide uh, more of an academic and a research uh, perspective on this matter. And then finally, Ambassador Alexander Kement, Director of the Arms Control and Disarmament uh, Bureau at the Austrian Foreign Ministry uh, to provide more of a practitioner's uh, point of view. So from my understanding, nuclear risk reduction seems to have replaced efforts at nuclear arms control and disarmament. If we look at the history of nuclear risk reduction and arms control going back to the early days of the Cold War, when nuclear weapons were just being introduced into the arsenals of the two nuclear superpowers, avoidance of nuclear war and risk reduction was a very important component but it was also, in a sense, based in efforts at uh, negotiated arms control and risk reduction agreements. And it seems that this connection between nuclear risk reduction and arms control and disarmament agreements seems to have either been weakened or lost. And if I do some dot connecting, in 1995, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was extended indefinitely on the basis of certain decisions that were taken that included one on principles and objectives for nuclear arms control and disarmament. Uh, this was followed in 2000 by 13 practical steps agreed by the states parties and in particular the nuclear weapon states. Then at the next review conference in 2000, some of these practical steps were uh, um, uh, sorry, in 2000, the practical steps were announced, but that the next review conference that succeeded was in 2010, there was an action plan with 22 actions. And in the view of many, some of the practical steps and the 13 steps that were agreed in 2000 seem to have been diluted in the 2000 action uh, plan. In 2015, the NPT review conference failed and unfortunately, last year's review conference failed as well. So it's interesting that some of the states that were members of nuclear uh, defense arrangements started talking about nuclear risk reduction. 
And slowly, the proposals that were made by groupings such as the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Initiative, uh, even the New Agenda Coalition, and then the Stockholm Initiative all began to focus on risk reduction measures. Uh, and very interestingly, in 2018, a proposal was made by one nuclear weapon state to create the conditions for nuclear disarmament. Uh, and then this was changed to creating the environment for nuclear disarmament. And then some 30 or 40 states were invited to take part in these discussions. And it's important that this, uh, this initiative of 2018 came a year after the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was negotiated and opened for signature. And the nuclear weapon states boycotted the open-ended working groups on taking forward multilateral negotiations on nuclear disarmament uh, that took place in 2014 and also 2016. So from my point of view, this creating the environment for nuclear disarmament and the focus on risk reduction measures uh, was a way to distract from uh, the collapsing architecture set up during the Cold War, uh, the ending of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2018, then the ending of the intermediate range and shorter forces uh, treaty in 2019, and now the last bilateral arms control agreement hanging by a thread, New START, uh, is there, and there is no talk of any new arms control agreements or uh, reduction agreements uh, on, on the table and all the talk is about nuclear risk reduction. So with those comments, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Andre to go first to talk about uh, the work that he is doing uh, at Unidir and, and what the prospects are from Unidir's point of view on putting forward uh, proposals and ideas to member states of the United Nations. Andre, over to you. Thanks, Tarek. Uh, good afternoon or good time of the day, depending on where you're Calling from, um, it's a pleasure to speak in such a great company, and I thank the organizers, Atomic Reporters, and Conrad and our foundation, but also Tarek personally for inviting me to speak. And the usual disclaimer, the views expressed here are mine and not those of Unidir or the United Nations. So in my presentation, I will try to explain where we are now with nuclear risk reduction. Why is it that we are where we are and where we could go from here? Uh, first of all, there is no internationally agreed definition of nuclear risk or nuclear risk reduction measures, but in the broadest sense, it's about prevention of nuclear use. As my former colleague Wilfred Van put in Unitier's paper in 2019, nuclear risk reduction is about decreasing the possibility that nuclear weapons are used, whether deliberately or inadvertently. Now, some would argue that this definition is not broad enough, and the mere fact of nuclear weapons existing, even if they are not used, is causing harm. Others would include nuclear testing and maybe even attack against nuclear facilities. But I think it's fair to say that the biggest concern is still the direct use of nuclear weapons, or to put it in a different way, nuclear war. And this fear is obviously not new, and neither are the efforts to address it. It is reflected in the NPT preamble in 1968, which says, considering the devastations that would be visited upon all mankind by nuclear war and the consequent need to make every effort to avert the danger of such war. And it was prominently displayed in the final document of the first United Nations Special Session on Disarmament of 1978. Among many references, paragraph 20 said, among such measures, effective measures of nuclear disarmament and the prevention of nuclear war have the highest priority. To this end, it is imperative to remove the threat of nuclear weapons at the same time, other measures designed to prevent the outbreak of nuclear war and to lessen the danger of the threat or use of nuclear weapons should be taken. So where are we today with all of this? Well, on one hand, there have been no nuclear attack since 1945, which is good. On the other hand, there is a clear concern in the international community that as the tensions between nuclear armed states rise and the existing guard rays disappear, this norm of non-use is getting weaker and might not hold. And despite you know, this long history and this considerable concern, the nuclear risk reduction as a concept is an orphan in the international disarmed machinery. There is no multilateral document either legally or politically binding, 
there is no organization or even a dedicated UN process that would deal with nuclear risk reduction. So why is that? Uh, there is a number of reasons, but I think three following one explain why we are where we are. So the first is this feeling uh, that nuclear armed states should deal with this. And it's partly coming from the nuclear weapon states themselves, but partly also coming from, from other parts. And as Tarek mentioned, there indeed are nuclear risk reduction agreements between nuclear armed states, chiefly between Moscow and Washington. There is a number of agreements uh, looking at specific issues. Uh, there is agreements in generally to prevent nuclear war and so on and so forth. But it also was always disputed. Uh, it was disputed in SSOD1. It was disputed in other form. Um, and generally, this is this part of feeling that, um, you know, anti-democratic order, which where nuclear weapon states have different rights and they have to, you know, solve the problems and everybody else just have to wait and, and listen how they are doing this. So this, this is the first reason. The second reason is the feeling that nuclear risk reduction as a process, uh, and Tarek alluded to it, is a disruption traction from the main goal, which is nuclear disarmament. Uh, and that's why we have some, you know, in initiatives like Stockholm Initiative uh, championing nuclear risk reduction. We have uh, CEND as a process, which has a working group, but those are more like coalition of willings. Uh, those are not, you know, UN-wide uh, groupings. Uh, again, uh, this was also disputed. Uh, Action 5 of 2010 NPT Action Plan says, uh, discuss policies that could prevent the use of nuclear weapons and reduce the risks of accidental use of nuclear weapons. Uh, we have, you know, SSOD1, as I was uh, citing before, we have uh, quite robust nuclear risk reduction uh, part in APT uh, 2020 final document, which was adopted by consensus. The document failed uh, because of other issues, but the risk reduction part was uh, agreed by everybody. Um, so there is again this, this tension inside between the people who are saying, well, nuclear risk reduction is a distraction from Article 6. And then those who are saying like, well, we need to do something with risks, they are high and we want to decrease them. And the third point uh, which explains where we are at the moment is that nuclear risk reduction is pretty much everything. And it means different things to different people. Uh, so it's hard to agree on what exactly are we discussing and where we're trying to get with this. Because in a most broad sense, disarmament could be called nuclear risk reduction measure because you know it will ultimately decrease nuclear risk to zero. Arms control could be a nuclear risk reduction measure, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is no understanding between nuclear arms states where the risks are coming from, um, and you know their allies have different views on this. Um, Non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, you know, have different views on this. So, and then we have a lot of specific recommendations on how to reduce nuclear risk. You know, a lot of smart people have been writing about this. UNIDIR has written a lot about this, but, you know, we're not unique here. But since approaches are so different, even the best of those recommendations can be seen as increasing risk rather than decreasing, which might sound paradoxical, but for example, if you as a non-nuclear weapon state believes that nuclear risk reduction measures are there to prolong the status quo, to normalize nuclear weapons, and just to say like, well, they are safe and good and they can be kept indefinitely. So you increase the lifespan, the nuclear weapons will be there. You're basically increasing the risks that at some point in this indefinite lifespan, something will happen. Or for a, nu for a nuclear weapon state, you can see risk reduction measures as an attempt by other nuclear weapon states to undermine your security, but also making sure that they are safe and secure in undermining it, that these uh, hostile actions are cost-free for them, which would invite more undermining of your security, which could eventually lead to nuclear use. So this, I think, gives you an impression of how difficult a job is to do something uh, on nuclear risk reduction at global level in multilateral diplomacy. So what processes deal with nuclear risk reduction for the moment? Well, there is NPT, as I already mentioned. Uh, there is uh, specific uh, things happening there. 
uh, in P5, the process of consultation between five nuclear weapon states under the French presidency in 2021, they started having like dedicated discussion on risk reduction, and that's still ongoing, uh, as far as I know, and uh, it's good that it's ongoing. Uh, CD, as of lately, has been discussing nuclear risk reduction, uh, the latest one under the Finnish uh, presidency a couple of months back. Um, even UN Disarmament Commission has been talking about nuclear risk reduction, CND, already mentioned by uh, Tariq, as a dedicated working group, working group three, dedicated nuclear risk reduction. And then we have other coalitions like Stockholm Initiative, NPDI, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what what you know broad questions remain? What are broad questions which could be uh, up for discussion multilaterally about nuclear risk reduction? Well, there could be some specific issues, specific actions which could be taken, uh, and this is uh, which the route which uh, NPT context has been pursuing for a while. For example de alerting, uh, the targeting, those are one specific little things which will reduce nuclear risks. Uh, and that can be continued. You can find consensus over some of those. Uh, another thing uh, which has been discussed, which can be up to a discussion, is coming up with compendium of best practices on nuclear risk reduction and agreeing on that. Uh, we can also talk Andre, about... Could, yes. could you wind up in two minutes, please? I will. I will do my best. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, joint risk perceptions, trying to agree on what are the risks which would be shared by everybody. And then we can come up with some kind of document, a treaty, an agreement, a code of conduct, and develop this and, and okay, accept it through the United Nations. So through which mechanisms can be done? I know this. Uh, well, group of governmental experts, GE, OWG, open-ended working group. Uh, we can task Secretary General, well, nation states can task Secretary General to write a, a report on some of this. Uh, United Nations General Assembly resolution can be passed. Uh, then things can be done in the peer review process. And then there was proposals of summit process like Nuclear Security Summit. So all of those have their ups and downs, the you know pluses and minuses, the drawbacks and their advantages. But before we and we can discuss those in Q and A. Um, some of them, uh, like four broad conclusions, I can say before we go into all of this. First of all, we need to clearly understand what exactly we are trying to achieve, because as I said, it's a very broad process, broad field. So without narrowing it down, it's impossible to do anything on it. Second thing, there is a widespread opinion that nuclear weapon states will not figure it out on their own, and non-nuclear weapon states should be involved. How exactly? It's up for discussion, but at least there is this feeling that no, you cannot solve this alone. The third thing, uh, concern of nuclear risk reduction substituting disarmament would have to be addressed if we want to this to happen multilaterally. And the last point, some kind of consensus among the P5 would be needed. So unilateral measures are also an option and it's an avenue for future research. And I'll leave it here and we'll be happy to discuss any of this in more details. Thank you very much, Andre. So you mentioned the P5, I call them the nuclear weapon states process. So they talk about now strategic risk reduction. And a, def a distinction is made that nuclear risk reduction focuses specifically on nuclear weapons related risks, whereas strategic risk reduction encompasses the broadest set of measures that addresses various dimensions of conflict and competition between states. So could you give me a very short response to this particular point please well as far as i understand uh, it was introduced by the by the french and the thinking behind it is basically is that strategic uh, risks and strategic risk reduction is about for example conventional conflicts which can then escalate to nuclear and there is this uh, same school of thought which says that well any conflict between nuclear weapon states should not happen because it could escalate. So let's not only talk about specific use of nuclear weapons, but you know broader conditions and relations between nuclear weapon states. I don't know how successful they are in, in getting through this, but we can see in the declaration of P5 uh, for the review conference, the previous review conference, but also in the statement about nuclear war that not cannot be won, should not be fought. You, you see some of the thinking that nuclear weapon states should not fight each other. 
Okay, yeah. thank you very much. So moving on to Francesca Giovannini, you're managing the Atom, which is a big project. And you recently started a, a new project on rethinking these issues. So we'd be very happy to hear your views on this. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon from Vienna, everyone. I want to thank the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Atomic Reporters, uh, you, Tarek, for moderating this panel. And of course, all the people who are taking the time this afternoon to meet with us and discuss this very important topic. Now, I want to start by saying that every single moment of crisis in history somehow brings some pipes and needs to create some concepts that could somehow reassure that something can be done. And I consider very much the risk reduction uh, uh, message to be a very hype message with a more modest impact on the ground. In fact, I went back and you introduced me as an academic, Tarek, I went back to see when the first piece on risk reduction, nuclear risk reduction appeared actually uh, in the United States. And it was in 1963, immediately after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in fact, even Thomas Schelling in the 70s, we're talking about reassurances in the nuclear deterrence threats as a mechanism for risk reduction. Bernard Brody, all the biggest thinkers in nuclear deterrence have talked about risk reduction at the peak of the Cold War. So there's really nothing new here. And in fact, let me say that the fact that we are convening discussions today on risk reduction, that should tell us how backward we have walked uh, you know, along the path of history. We are not moving forward, we're just going back and somehow repackaging and reshaping concepts that you know, theorists of the Cold War had actually invented long ago. I think there is also a risk, quite frankly, of talking about or emphasizing too much risk reduction because it gives you the illusion that in this mess of you know, nuclear threats, uh, you know, nuclear coercion, then there are some risks that can be managed or can somehow the situation can be freezing time so that, you know, somehow nothing will go worse than it is already. But I think situations can go worse and I think we should not give the illusion that risk reduction can just freeze a multiple correlated crisis at the moment in time. Now, I don't discount the point that, uh, as many colleagues of mine have made, that the risk reduction might be an area for cooperation among nuclear weapon states. And some have also argued that this is an area of cooperational interest between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. But I would posit that in order to really reduce risks among nuclear weapon states much more than this current strategy of nu on nuclear risk reduction need to be done. And I would also argue that non-nuclear weapon states would really take much more than just risk reduction in order to guarantee their survival in this world. Now, let me clarify what actually I, I mean by nuclear risk reduction. I think there are two components. The first one is what Andre has talked about, which is the risk of nuclear war. But during the Cold War, risk reduction also meant preventing nuclear incidents or accidents due, for example, to human error or technical fallacies. And in fact, my colleague Joe Nye talked about the risk reduction during the Cold War as almost simply prudent practices. There was nothing ambitious. It was just trying to reduce the safety perils of nuclear weapons infrastructure. And during the Cold War, we were actually re really looking at making nuclear weapons arsenals more safe. And that's why we introduced a bunch of practices that remain today, like the permissive action links, which are a bunch of codes that somehow allowed only authorized people to launch actually upon the presidential uh, direction, the two-man rule, safety measures, hotlines, and so on and so forth. Now, over time, and this is, this is a very important concept, and I think it goes back to what you talked about, Tarek, risk reduction became linked to the idea of more, which is arms control. And so we've started asking, for example, changes in doctrine. We've started thinking about de-alerting. We started thinking about command and control, crisis communication, but all of this were thought as not only the only step in a vacuum, but it was in a continuum to moving along and building on this for longer and stronger cooperation. But I think today risk reduction is based on assumptions that we could, can't uh, no longer make. And let me give you four assumptions that in my view are no longer true today. And by the way, I gave a similar talk at NATO uh, in Riga uh, this week, and I urge especially scholars really to rethink the assumptions because you can't just take a concept out of the Cold War and apply it to today, but you have to think about the assumptions we made then that are no longer viable today. The first, the first assumption on risk reduction is that the stable balance of power would benefit from a degree of moderation in both the actor behaviors as well in military balance. 
So both superpowers at the time of the Cold War saw moderation and restraint as a critical instrument for their own survival and nuclear deterrence. I think moderation has gone out of the window today. So restraint is no longer the principle on which we can actually base risk, risk reduction. The second assumption is that the cost of accepting risk reduction could actually be acceptable for a domestic audience in particular. But I think this is also not true today. I think if the United States was serious about engaging in risk reduction strategies with China and the, and the Russians, they would actually be, consider an enormous amount of cost among audience that I'm not sure the United States would be, would be ready actually to, to pay, especially in a time of presidential campaign. The third assumption that is that the risk reduction strategies with your adversary will ultimately not be exploited by third parties. But today we are no longer in a bipolar world, we are in a multipolar world. So risk reduction strategies between the US and, and Russia will always somehow bring, especially in the US, the belief that the Chinese might in fact exploit the vulnerabilities that risk reduction somehow impose. So you either have multipolar risk reduction or you have none. And finally, most importantly, the risk reduction strategies were somehow based on the assumption that we had a common view of what the risks were and some of symmetrical risk perceptions. I think today we are very far from this. I think we somehow blame each other on being really the risk, you know, uh, triggering factors. And I think we just see the risk in the world very differently across multiple uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapon states. So let me mention uh, just a couple of, of suggestions for how I would move forward the conversation. I think it is time that we actually embrace the crisis we are facing. And we stop talking about risk reduction and we talk about crisis management. We are in a crisis. There is nothing to reduce here. There are crises that need to be managed and need to be managed with intelligence, with competence, but also quite frankly, with political courage. And I think in order to do that, we need to do three things. One, we need to insist on unilateral, unilateral risk reduction strategies. I think waiting for reciprocity is never going to cut it. If we are waiting for China, if we are waiting for the US, if you're waiting for Russia, this is not going to happen. So at some point in crisis management, individual nuclear weapon states will have to stand up and say, this is actually for my national security, for my alliance security, for my region security, and this is a unilateral step I intend to take. The second in my view is we need to identify new bridge builders. I said this to NATO the other day, it wasn't very welcome, but I think it's an important point. Sweden and Finland for many years operated as bridge builders between the United States and Russia. The entrance of Finland and Sweden into NATO removes a bridge building link between these two nuclear weapon states. The more we push the allies to choose and the more somehow we lose the gray area of third parties that can actually really foster these negotiations. The final point, Tarek, I think we need a victory here. We need to really break the loop of doom and gloom here. And so I think we need a serious initiative on two fronts. One on tactical nuclear weapons. I think we need somehow to create a consortium of actors that really look at the specific risk tactical nuclear weapons pose. And we need to put on the table very concrete and very tangible proposals. And the second one is, I think we need to take more seriously the risk that the moratorium on nuclear testing will actually go um, uh, under major challenges moving forward. I leave it at that and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Francesca. And thank you for bringing back some of the early academic discussion, also preparing for this uh, webinar. I was reading some of the textbooks that I read when I was doing my master's in war studies. You know, Bernard Brody's absolute uh, weapon from crossbow to H-bomb escalation and nuclear option. You mentioned Thomas Schelling, it's the strategy of conflict, arms and influence. Um, but leaving that aside for now, you made a couple of very important points. Uh, so you mentioned now that we have lost the bridge builders. And the second point uh, among others that you mentioned was to focus on non-strategic nuclear weapons. So uh, we did have some initiatives in 1991, if you remember the presidential nuclear initiatives that removed non-strategic nuclear weapons from ships and submarines of the Soviet Navy and the United States Navy. So what specific uh, ideas might you have now for non-strategic nuclear weapons? And are you talking about the five weapon states or are you talking about the other states that are also nuclear weapon possessors but not part of the non-proliferation treaty regime? 
So uh, thank you, Tarek. This is a really important question. I think, you know, in, in a way we need to help. So what you talked about in 1991, I also believe when, it, when I talk about unilateral uh, measures, I really think that this needs to come down uh, from presidential initiatives. A presidential initiative that could say, you know, I want to launch an, a, 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 new, a, a new action plan to enhance transparency at the nuclear test sites, right? This is something that a president could easily launch first with your, with your alliances, then with like third parties. And so really give a sense that you, these norms really still matter. But let me also say that in order somehow to do serious work on reducing the role of tactical nuclear weapons, which is in my view really heightening and increasing today, we need somehow to shift and tilt the balance towards conventional deterrence. We don't speak enough about the conventional nuclear deterrence linkage. I was in East Asia and I was surprised, for example, that Korea insisted so much on having tactical nuclear weapons on its territory, but never actually mentioned the superiority on conventional deterrence that they have versus North Korea. So in order somehow to actually embrace a real, a real reduction in tactical nuclear weapons, we need to set the narrative towards conventional deterrence at, at the theater level. And we are not even there yet. So no one will want to talk about tactical nuclear weapons unless we convince that the theater level conventional remains in fact your best bet. So there is a lot of work to be done on this. Um, and then let me say, I personally do not believe that we should limit the discussions only to the P5. I think it's really important that all nuclear weapon states are now into a conversation because as I said, it's either a multipolar approach or it's none. It's very unthinkable that the US and China will go into a risk reduction strategy without China thinking about its impact on, on India, for example, or India and Pakistan. And so because of this entanglement, the multilateral approach I think is really the only possible one. Thank you. Good. Thanks. I will come back to you later after Alex Adler has spoken because there are concerns as regards conventional deterrence that the United States global prompt strike capability gives them a conventional advantage. And if you remove nuclear weapons from the table, the U.S. will again be dominant. But that's another discussion. So coming to you, um, Ambassador Alexander Kement, uh, you presided over the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons first meeting last year and were instrumental and, and getting this treaty through. Um, how do the TPNW states and Austria as a small nuclear state in an increasingly polarized world look at these issues of uh, nuclear risk reduction and strategic risk reduction? Thank you, uh, Tariq, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. I'd like to thank the, con con uh, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and, and uh, Atomic Reporters for hosting this event, inviting me and uh, uh, all, all the participants who are interested in uh, listening to us today. I'm glad to contribute, to be able to contribute to this uh, discussion. And uh, like uh, um, my colleagues, I will speak in my personal capacity. There's been, of course, much focus on the risk reduction issue in, in recent years, and also the increased understanding about nuclear risks together with the increased understanding on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, both of them played a crucial role in the whole process that led to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And since then, um, also critics of the TBNW, um, nuclear weapon states and others have seized more on this issue and have also underscored the bridge building potential of uh, risk reduction as a discussion. So some say that that should be the focus now uh, with tension being so high and, and prospects uh, for and the progress of nuclear disarmament being being uh, being low and stalled. Uh, but at the NPT REFCON last year, we saw uh, pushback from some non-nuclear weapon states uh, against too much focus on risk reduction, uh, with the argument that this is portrayed as a substitute for nuclear disarmament and the implementation of Article Six. So it's a, it's 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 a, it's in a way, quite a contentious issue as well. Now, my take on this issue is slightly different. Uh, yes, absolutely, risk reduction is not a substitute for nuclear disarmament and for the implementation of Article 6, but nuclear risks are higher today than they have been in a very long time. The famous doomsday clock stands at 90 seconds uh, before midnight, which is closer than it's ever been since 1947 when the clock was started. And that was, these risks were high already before the Russian invasion of 
Ukraine when the clock stood at 90 uh, at 100 seconds to uh, to uh, to midnight so the risk of nuclear conflict of any form of accident uh, miscalculations and so on uh, is high and has been high for a while so any measure to reduce these risks I would say is is important and indeed I would say that anyone who says that they are concerned about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons should also be supportive of any measure that reduces the risks of nuclear weapons being used given the enormous humanitarian and other consequences of nuclear weapons explosion the importance of minimizing and eliminating these risks uh, cannot be overstated. But of course, the focus and the discussion on risk reduction, the key issue is how this discussion is framed. And if we look at it a bit more closely, we see that within the international community discussing this issue, that there are, there are very different perspectives on, 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 on what constitutes nuclear risks uh, and consequently what nuclear risk reduction should, should actually mean. So views vary whether uh, nuclear risks originate primarily from the possession of nuclear weapons, from use scenarios, from intent, from the safety and security of nuclear weapons, uh, from uh, the prevention of accidents, from policies, from doctrines, uh, or from uh, more uh, strategic uh, nuclear risks. In the process that led to the TPNW, non-nuclear weapon states focused very much on the risks stemming from the possession of nuclear weapons and from the practice of nuclear deterrence per se, rather than from the action of individual states. So su such a focus, and I think that's important, such a focus leads to an aggregated view of the nuclear weapons practices of all nuclear armed states together and the resulting risks for all humanity. And this aggregated view on nuclear risks defines, I think, the perspective of how most non-nuclear weapon states uh, look at this issue, and which is now, of course, enshrined in the, in the, in the TPNW. So for the non-nuclear weapon states, it's the grave humanitarian consequences that would result from nuclear explosions, which are the risks to which they also are exposed to against their will and, of course, outside their control, at least largely. And these risks result from the possession of nuclear weapons and from the security policies that are based on nuclear deterrence and that are pursued by nuclear armed states and states that rely on extended nuclear deterrence. These risks could materialize through the deliberate use uh, of nuclear weapons uh, or miscalculation uh, or any form of an accident, a human or technical error. So not only parties to a potential nuclear conflict bear those risks, but of course all other states, innocent bystanders to this conflict, to any conflict who would, uh, whose populations would end up as collateral damage in, in very severe ways. And we now have a lot of empirical evidence that this, uh, th this uh, would be much more serious than previously understood. So given the, given the conflicts and tensions involving nuclear armed states with multiple deterrence relationships, the potential for nuclear escalation is, con, is, con, is considerable. Threat perceptions of nuclear armed states are generally intertwined and mutually reinforcing. There's overconfidence, or at least the risk of overconfidence in the stability of nuclear deterrence or the perceived need to demonstrate the credibility of nuclear deterrence at all times, which could lead to overly aggressive uh, uh, rhetoric uh, and reckless nuclear posturing. And I think Russia's strident nuclear uh, rhetoric that we see recently is an example uh, of, of, uh, of that. Non-nuclear weapon states also increasingly understand the multiple example of past near misses that demonstrate the high level of risk and the sort of degree of good fortune, or in the words of Robert McNamara, sheer dumb luck that has prevented nuclear war in the, in the past. So with the probability of these situations uh, uh, taking place and the risks materializing is of course hard to assess and maybe con considered low, but these risks exist and they're certainly very serious given the scale of the consequences. So non-nuclear weapon states therefore see nuclear deterrence per se as a high risk practice, not only due to the grave consequences of these weapons, but also because it is practiced by humans. That it, that it relies on machines, on processes designed by humans, 
nuclear deterrence is not immune to technical error, and these risks are inherent in possessing and maintaining nuclear weapons. So one may assess the actions and behavior of one state or another state or one leader or another leader in a more or less risk prone way, but from the perspective on risk that's enshrined in the TPNW, these differences are actually not the central issue. It's the collective nuclear weapons policies and actions of all nuclear armed states together uh, that create an aggregated and interconnected set of global nuclear risks for all humanity. And from this perspective, nuclear risks lie in the fact that the practice of nuclear deterrence is in itself too precarious and the consequences of these weapons are too catastrophic and existential. So from this perspective, risk reduction must thus obviously reduce the likelihood of any nuclear weapons explosion, whether intentional, inadvertent, unintentional, or from accidents. So in addition to nuclear disarmament, which of course in itself is the gold standard of risk reduction, non-nuclear weapon states want to see measures that take nuclear weapons as far away from any use or accident as possible. And such steps would be the alerting, the targeting, taking weapons out of operational service, no first use, uh, commitments and uh, many other more, including transparency and so on. And in the eyes of many non-nuclear weapon states, the, the, the finding of the humanitarian uh, initiative and the high level of nuclear risk make such measures even more important and more urgent. And I think slightly contrary to that, nuclear weapon states, I think, advocate a more limited perspective on risk reduction, at least that's how I, I understand it. The views on nuclear risks appear conditioned with the primacy of maintaining strategic stability. Um, so nuclear ris risks are thus understood as coming from other potentially adversarial nuclear armed states, and the risks are assessed as regards the possible impact on the strategic relationship between those states. So in this view, risks stem primarily from the knowledge or lack of knowledge of the other's nuclear weapons capabilities, the intentions, the policies, or doubts about decision-making processes or security and safety procedures. And this perspective has a significant bearing on how risk reduction measures are assessed because it gives dominance to strategic risk reduction understood as countering risks that could undermine nuclear deterrence and strategic stability relationships. So consequently, risk reduction measures are geared towards avoiding or managing crisis and achieving better understanding of the, uh, of the intentions of uh, uh, adversaries so as to maintain more stable and less risky deterrence relationships. So in short, the focus of this perspective on risk reduction is to make nuclear deterrence work better rather than consider the risk of a practice of nuclear deterrence itself, which of course is the origin of nuclear risk in the first place. So this, this limits the range of nuclear risk reduction measures considerably. Measures that restrict the ability to use nuclear weapons, such as the alerting, the targeting, limiting nuclear weapons postures and so on, or removing weapons from operational status are assessed as having a negative impact on the credibility of nuclear deterrence and are therefore not or not sufficiently pursued. Risk reduction measures that are thus considered are thus considered only insofar as they do not impact the nuclear deterrence calculus, which in itself, of course, as I said before, is the origin of nuclear risks. And I think this demonstrates an inherent contradiction and conundrum, if, if you wish, posed by the necessity on the one hand to maintain nuclear weapons in a manner that demonstrates readiness to use them at all times, which is required for the credibility of nuclear de deterrence, and on the other hand, taking measures in a more comprehensive risk reduction uh, way to actually take these weapons out of the likelihood of, of uh, use to make sure that they will never be used, which of course is necessary for to have a full risk reduction approach. So I think nuclear armed states, uh, and I think this is a divide that is very visible in the risk reduction uh, discussion. And from my perspective, nuclear armed states have yet to engage meaningfully with non-nuclear weapon states on, on these risks, on the risks for all humanity, stemming from the possession of these weapons and from the collective practice of nuclear deterrence. And I think a good start 
To do that uh, would be to take the concerns that are expressed in the TPNW regarding the humanitarian consequences and risks uh, more seriously and to engage in a transparent, concrete and inclusive uh, discussion on risks, on nuclear risks that weighs the consequences and risks of nuclear weapons to all humanity on the one hand against the assumed security and stability benefits of nuclear deterrence. With such an approach, I think nuclear risk reduction could undoubtedly have a tremendous uh, bridge building potential, which it currently is not, uh, uh, which it currently doesn't doesn't have. Uh, but it has a potential in the very contested uh, nuclear weapons uh, discourse, and I think a focus on the strategic risk dimension only, without addressing also this more profound. Uh, dimension of nuclear risks uh, would remain incomplete, limited, and would ultimately just uh, uh, undermine this bridge building potential and would just lead to a further or, or, or to a continuation of the entrenchment that we see very much on many of these discussions. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Tony. Okay, so thank you, uh, Alexander. You made a number of very important points about uh, the risks of nuclear weapons, in particular the catastrophic risks. And in my view, Deterrence, nuclear deterrence itself is based on the risk of using nuclear weapons. And therefore, re uh, risk reduction, in a sense, is to strengthen deterrence, not necessarily to work more towards disarmament. But I wanted to put a different question to you. Um, in the ICRC reports uh, in 2016 and so on, that led to the discussion on the catastrophic uh, consequences of the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. The focus was on a nuclear war between India and Pakistan that would create a nuclear winter. Uh, but now the biggest danger of nuclear war is here in Europe, where you have an active war going on now for 18 months or so. Uh, there's a policy of a strategic defeat of one nuclear state. That nuclear state in return has threatened to use nuclear weapons were it to face strategic defeat. But nobody is talking about this risk. Nobody is making the calculations. What would happen if there was nuclear weapon use in Europe, the impact on the European populations and the impact on the global population, uh, and so on, like was done in the case of India and Pakistan? That's a very valid point. I mean, first of all, what's the biggest nuclear risk? We don't know, I think, the fair answer. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 um, nuclear threats by Russia are suddenly very close to Europe uh, and, and, and have certainly contributed to greater level of awareness, uh, but still not to a, to, a, to a point of view where people really in the street talk about this issue all the time, which I think they should. To what extent that risk is greater than the situation in North Korea or potentially between India and Pakistan or in, the, uh, or, or in Asia in general, I don't know. It's very difficult to assess nuclear risk. We don't know, I think, is the, is, is the fair answer, other than that we know that this risk is not zero. But it's absolutely true, and I'm, I'm, I, 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 I agree with you entirely. I find it flabbergasting in many ways how, how, how little uh, this issue is discussed. I think the general public, by and large, still doesn't take this issue as seriously as it should, and I think all of us have a have a big job to do to make uh, to make sure that that changes. Not in a sense of creating panic, but in a but in a in a way of um, underscoring the fact that this is one of the key existential risks to all humanity, and uh, uh, that we need to increase uh, effort and international cooperation to address it. It is still an issue that is largely discussed uh, essentially within, within the nuclear weapons bubble. And uh, the positions and entrenchments are very strong there. I'm absolutely convinced that we will only see uh, positive change on the nuclear weapons issue if we actually succeed in um, broadening this debate considerably. And, and, and uh, we haven't achieved that yet. Okay, so thank you. So we have a number of questions that have come in, but I wanted to put one question to all three of you uh, first. Um, I was sort of made a list of somewhere around 12 or 14 uh, bilateral nuclear risk reduction 
agreements and measures that were agreed between the Soviet Union and the United States from 1971 and then Russia till 2000. And then between India and Pakistan, we also have eight or nine different uh, nuclear risk reduction uh, measures. But now we are living in a different world. In the Cold War world, we had a dyad, the United States and the Soviet Union. And we, in a different context, we had another dyad, which was India and Pakistan. Some people call it also a triad with China, India, and Pakistan. Now, the United States defense thinking is talking about living in a world with three nuclear superpowers. So they're they are now saying that China is the major threat and China is coming up to be a peer uh, competitor and a peer nuclear force. So how do, we, how do we deal with this new complex world of a new triad with the China, United States and Russia, a, a dyad, uh, India and Pakistan? And if we accept that there's a triad, China, India and Pakistan, uh, I don't think North Korea is in a dyad situation because it's the only nuclear power there in South Korea and Japan don't have it. But leaving that aside, how can we then fit this discussion on strategic risk reduction and nuclear risk reduction into this more complex and evolving uh, world? So maybe we start with you, Francesca. Thank you, thank you Tarek. I, I think, you know, I, I think you are, you are, you are um, actually raising a very important point because to be honest, this, this idea of near peer competitors now, which is really at the center of the debate in the United States is also pushing even the, the US nuclear community to think about not, not only let alone no risk reduction, but even going up in numbers in, term, in terms of deployment of nuclear weapons now in order to match both the Russian capabilities and the Chinese capabilities. To me, this moment in time reveals something that in my view, we have discounted for many, many years, which is really the, the need, the desperate need for a multilateral avenue where these discussions happen. And you know, it's true that the United Nations does not have a mandate to negotiate or discuss uh, you know, nuclear strategies that belong fundamentally to nuclear weapon states. And I also think that P5 is also not the right avenue, quite frankly. I mean, this is a very limited, limited uh, platform. So we need to find somehow, we need to create, in my view, a multilateral institutional mechanism where these discussions happen. And with the view not only of reducing the, the, the risk of today, but to give a sense of long-term, right? Uh, so to bypass a little bit what is like the urgency of the moment and try to project you know what 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 should be in fact the conditions and the end and the end goal at the end i don't have an idea exactly about this but for example one one thing i was thinking about that and, and this reminds me because again i was in nato the other day and i think that there is there is a platform that we have not used well enough which is the regional platform most of the communities from the Latin America community, to the Southeast Asia community, the South Pacific community have all created regional organizations. So they have, for example, treaties, the regional nuclear weapon free zones and so on and so forth. I think using these platforms to really have discussions about both the strategic risk reduction and, and what Alex was talking about, which is instead the much broader political, social and economic risk reduction strategy we need to, we need to achieve, I think would be terrific. And there has to be an engagement of nuclear weapon states with these regions, really putting together both their own needs and their own security visions and the needs and security visions of some other countries. So I would say an attempt to create something in the multilateral level, but at the same time leveraging the regional platforms, in my view, that actually exist. But, you know, in the conference on disarmament, in the Decalogue on the agenda, nuclear disarmament is there and it's a perennial issue along with uh, negative security assurances, fissile material and nuclear disarmament. Uh, but there's no progress there. The weapon states do not even want to discuss nuclear disarmament formally. They believe that a fissile material treaty is the next logical step, but then nobody knows what the next step is after that. No, I agree. And in fact, I don't think the conference on disarmament is really the way, the way to go. I mean, I was thinking more about, you know, an institution that could have, for example, you know, regional participations that could have, you know, uh, representatives of the non-nuclear weapon states community and nuclear weapon states. And it could also be a sort of more of a, a of a dialogue convener, a sustained dialogue convener that does not necessarily only try to influence policy, but really tries somehow to think 
even more theoretical about you know some of the conditions we would like to achieve altogether. So I don't think I don't think the UN and the old bodies of the UN will actually be ready to to be used in that way. Okay, Andre, your views on my question? Well, it's a it's a very broad and um, complicated question. I would say I I wouldn't worry as much about these triads. Uh, as a as a new thing, I think the one thing which concerns me the most is that we are currently witnessing things which you haven't seen before. Is the um, you know challenges to you know hegemony or what have you? At, but like at least we are seeing situation where status quo is challenged and actively challenged, or at least some players part perceive it as that. So when we had, you know, Soviet Union and uh, United States uh, with nuclear weapons, at the beginning, yes, there were some clashes, but most of the Cold War, nobody was trying to challenge the other, you know, like United States was not trying to take Hungary, United States, uh, Soviet Union was not trying to, you know, invade Canada, what have you. Now we can see that some of the nuclear weapon states perceive other nuclear weapon states as trying to actively undermine them. So disrupt the status quo, or they want to you know, build a new status quo. And when that's happened, so when you have a status quo and you're just messing around, you can agree to the rule of the road. How do you make this game more safe for everybody? When you see the whole world potentially or your order falling down as a result, you are much less interested in any rules of the road because you believe that the rule of the road benefit the stronger party or this party who wants to eat his cake and have it as well so i think that's that's bigger problem and i wonder if uh, if we have much precedent for this in history uh in terms of uh, nuclear risk reduction measures which could be taken i'm i'm still an optimist in some technical ideas and technical fixes uh, even is if we cannot solve the big problem, uh, or while we are solving this big problem, uh, and the best example of this uh, that I heard is uh, not from myself; it's from Linton Brooks. But he said, like, well, we have disagreements of detargeting, so five nuclear weapon states presumably target not each other, but target you know oceans or the, there's no just. Uh, flight uh, trajectory inserted in their weapons. Like, we don't know if that's true. There's no way to verify it, but it's in such a great interest of every country that if there is a technical malfunction, you would not hit the other country by chance, that we all assume that this is what, what happens. Like, we all want this to happen. There's no reason for us not to have this strategy. So I think we can think about things like that which at least would make total sense for everybody. I think it's very complicated, but it's not impossible. But on the broader scale, yeah, it's, it's again, very, very tough uh, because the crisis, because in everything, I think when you think about multilateral uh, forum, which exists, NPT is one clear forum in which both nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states participate. And it seems that non-nuclear weapon states are trying now to use this forum to get something from nuclear weapon states, at least on nuclear risk production. So if there is some consensus among non-nuclear weapon states of what exactly do they want from nuclear weapon states, and if there is some of this which nuclear states can give, you can see some of this happening in, in the review process and if we see if the working group will succeed in getting any uh, progress on uh, evaluating the pledges made by nuclear weapon states for countries in general. But I think that would be also an interesting uh, avenue to watch, uh, I think the, the biggest on the global level. Okay, thanks. I, I think I disagree with you there, Andre. I think the NPT is now a dead forum for discussing nuclear disarmament, unfortunately. Um, also, um, even the promoters of um, nuclear risk reduction have seen some literature where they're questioning detargeting. And they are saying that if you detarget, you make yourself vulnerable to a conventional attack. So I'm not asking you to answer that now, but maybe we'll come back to it. And secondly, 
as you mentioned, Linton Brooks proposal, and I respect Linton a lot because he was also on this uh, group uh, convened by Japan. But you know, if a nuclear weapon is launched, you don't know whether it's by accident or by design. And given the way things are structured now, you have you know 15 minutes, 20 minutes, seven minutes to decide, and that's a very short time. So there's still the danger, even if they're detargeted and you have an accidental launch because of a technical glitch. If I'm at the other side, I don't know that, and I, maybe I will want to respond because I don't want to be the victim of a first strike. But we can come back to this later. Uh, go, going back to you, Alexander, and then I'll uh, put up the, some of the questions that have come in to us. Thank you. Um, I have to admit I have very little confidence in uh, uh, nuclear weapon states uh, being able to take very serious uh, risk reduction measures themselves. Because as you rightly pointed out, an element of risk, uncertainty, and ambiguity is a central element, the way nuclear deterrence is practiced now. So um, I, 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 I don't really see that. I think, I mean, it's not the silver bullet answer that I have, but what I would say in terms of the discursive process that's obviously necessary to change attitudes should come much stronger from the non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, that these risks that are inherent in the practice of nuclear deterrence create existential risks for the rest of the world. That this creates incredibly serious legitimacy issue, legal issues, justice issues, intergenerational justice issues, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, thereby uh, change the discourse to um, insist on more serious uh, disarmament and risk reduction measures being taken. We don't quite see that yet, I admit, but I think that is, that is, that is the, that I think is the more promising way to go than to wait for nuclear weapon states to take these measures themselves. And here we are back again at the point that you raised before the level of public discourse on these issues. I think that is really, that is the key issue to, to uh, have any sort of material change on this, uh, on, the, on the status quo. Thanks. I think this is why the Conrad Adenauer Foundation's multilateral dialogue and atomic report is we in our way are trying to promote nuclear discourse at our level and there are to be other forums. So let me put some questions. So there was one question addressed to Francesca. Um, who would be the new bridge builders? Must they not be members of alliances or other groupings such as NATO, Russia, or China? Are there no bridge builders within these groups? And are these not in fact, is, is this not in fact essential? Uh, then I'll put the question to um, Alexander. The possession of nuclear weapons is a strong argument in promoting the political goals of nuclear armed states. Um, would you agree with this uh, proposition? And to, uh, Alex, to Andre, I would put an, a question that nuclear disarmament is the main integral element of nuclear risk reduction and is the only way to achieve the goal of nuclear weapons uh, elimination. So starting with you, Francesca. I think the question of bridge builders is fundamental. And uh, um, so two, two notes on this. And this is where I think when we think about strategic risk reduction, what is required as unilateral actions, but also political courage. And I want to give you two examples, which I think ultimately will actually undermine NATO security or even our East Asia security. You know, the more we continue somehow to push those alliances, uh, you know, close to Washington, and I don't disagree, there are plenty of reasons to do that. And the more somehow we basically lose the gray area that some of these countries, although we're semi-aligned with our interest, we're also providing, you know, the sort of dialogue convening power. One classical example was Korea. Korea was for many, many years and has been a very interesting, very smart hedging country where they thought they didn't think in zero sum gain. They thought about the potential economic profits with China. They thought about a relation with Russia. They thought about the relation with the United States. But I think right now with this idea of great powers competition, you know, the gray areas disappear. And so these countries are somehow forced into a corner. It's either with us or is, is against us. 
I think this is this is a politically really a sh very short term and a little bit narrow minded. In reality, we should actually allow countries to navigate the gray space and see the potentials of connections and cooperation and risk reduction strategies in a way that perhaps you as a nuclear weapon states cannot see. But let me say where I think the next bridge builder is going, is going to come from. And this will not be liked by the non-aligned movement or many of the regions. But I do believe that the next competition is really going to be on regional nuclear weapon free zones. So let me give you an example. The AUKUS agreement has already pushed China to now court the Southeast Asia because all of a sudden the Chinese want to sign the additional protocol of the Southeast Asia, the Shanghai's uh, agreement. That is important because this is where regions that for many years fundamentally played a very marginal role, today can really set the conditions, the parameters, and quite frankly, the topics that they want to talk about, right? Everyone is going to court Latin America, South Pacific as already happening, the Southeast Asia, and, you know, Alex, you and I have talked about issue linkage and many other things. These are opportunities. Great powers competition open the opportunity for, reg for regions of non-nuclear weapon state, non-aligned countries to really set their own agenda. And there it requires both political courage from non-nuclear weapon states, clarity, as Andre talked about, but also the, the, the understanding from nuclear weapon states that some concessions will have to be made. And I think if the regions develop that strategic thinking and really link nuclear disarmament demands and even you know, negative security assurances demands to economic trading, to security and so on and so forth, they can really get something in return here. Good, thank you. I, I will mention this because I've been involved with AUKUS in the context of naval nuclear propulsion and IAEA safeguards. And the concern of some of the Southeast Asian states is that they feel that they're caught in a difficult mind. They do not want to alienate China. They don't want to alienate the United States, the UK and Australia. And so they're searching for answers. So I will recommend that they listen to this particular answer of yours and to take some initiative uh, from it. Um, so I think I put the second question to Andre, if I remember. No, it was to Alexander. Okay, to Alexander. Yeah, the question, Alexander. Is, the question was whether the possession of nuclear weapons is, a, is an argument in the promotion of political goals of nuclear armed states, if I agree or not. And uh, um, I would say, yes, I agree. Um, we discuss nuclear weapons primarily as a security issue. And I think that's only half of the story. Um, and, and uh, once again, for the kind of broader uh, international discourse that we need to have on these on these weapons and what they mean, we need to bring in the political dimension, the status aspect, uh, uh, much more into the into the discussion than is currently the case. I think the 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 nuclear weapons discussion has been successfully framed by the nuclear armed states the way they want to have these issues addressed. And uh, what you see in terms of some of the developments that are going on, including the humanitarian focus in TPNW, is our attempts to, to broaden the discourse, uh, um, uh, to involve the General Assembly, to bring in actors who have previously not played such a strong uh, role or whose voices have not been heard. So I think that's, that's all part of it. Uh, and yes, the political uh, dimension of nuclear weapons is very important and is not discussed sufficiently. Okay. And to you, Andre? Yeah, so uh, my question was about whether the nuclear disarmament is the ultimate nuclear risk reduction measure. And of course, uh, it is. So if we don't have nuclear weapons, we won't have any problems. Uh, I also think that we can do uh, measures to reducing nuclear risks while nuclear weapons exist. They will probably exist for some time. Uh, so making them safer in the process would be a good thing. But I think that ultimately, if you're doing any multilateral uh, nuclear risk reduction, uh, you know, it's the global level, this would have to be tied with disarmament. So it would have to be nuclear risk reduction measures which support disarmament, promote disarmament, strengthen disarmament, speed disarmament up, and also reduce risks in the process. So I think something like that could be 
Um, so, uh, Andre, what is Unity you're saying on this? I don't speak for you in there. I know, but you know, there have been papers you mentioned by Wilfred yeah. Wan who talks about at different levels. So I'm, I'm talking about the, you know, the published research of Unity. About disarmament? Yeah, the link between risk reduction and disarmament. Uh, you know, the best message way of risk reduction is not to have the weapon in the first place. And so the papers by Wilfred Wan and uh, others have, have given you these graduated scenarios and so it's published by Unidir. One can say it's the view expressed by Unidir, so to speak. Right. So I don't think we have a paper or research which specifically would look into, you know, how you fit nuclear risk reduction in broader disarmament. And we are currently writing one, which would be on exactly this topic, how nuclear risk reduction fits into international disarmament machinery. And we actually plan to present it at the PrepCom in Vienna. So please uh, come uh, listen to us there. Uh, so yeah, uh, this 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 is something we are working on. All right, good. So I have a question and I'll put it to whoever wants to answer it, which is that no first use is in my view, the golden risk reduction measure. It has already been adopted by China and India as well as bilaterally by Russia and China. Uh, it is a concept understandable by leaders and public opinion. Could the speakers elaborate on this concept? So who would like to take that? I can start. All right. North use is a great concept. I fully support it. The question is, of course, uh, is this concept, which is political, primarily in nature, believed by other countries? So just to remind you, Soviet Union had a no first use policy starting from Brezhnev era and then till 1993, I think, and nobody in the West believed this. And it wasn't even broadly discussed, it just was seen as ploy by Soviet Union. So uh, I think the idea of no first use is an interesting one. I think it deserves more discussions and more practical discussions because um, the countries should be able to provide some level of assurance that this is true and this is complicated because as we've been saying all along nuclear deterrence is based on the fact that you have nuclear forces ready to be used if they're ready to be used then it's just political decision uh, which separates you from using them first or second or in which whatever way you believe so then how can you persuade your interlocutors that you're not going to use them first under any conditions, presumably even if your nuclear forces are being destroyed by conventional weapons. So but even Andre, in that but case, you, you see, the problem with no first use, while it's the attractive concept, is that one would take off the most destabilizing weapons, which would be land-based missiles and bombers. But you have this disparity there, where the bulk of the U.S. deterrent is at sea. The bulk of the Russian deterrent is at land, and now the bulk of the Chinese deterrent also will be uh, on land. On land. Yeah. So we, it, it doesn't really work very well. Uh, so it's, it's a declaratory policy. We cannot verify it. Contra, uh, nuclear weapon states uh, get credit for saying it, but in, in practice, it really means nothing. Uh, it's very hard to say that the risk has been reduced. So very briefly, because then I want to ask the other two if they want to chip in on this. Right, but that, that is my point exactly. You have to discuss how do you make it meaningful and how the countries believe that you have. Maybe that would involve cutting up something of your arsenals, but you have to you know, discuss and engage in that. Okay, thanks. Alexander or Francesca, would you like to weigh in on no first use? I don't really have to add much to the comments that Andre has made and of course the skepticism that you brought in as well. I think. Uh, um, that's, that's also my view on this issue. Okay. Thank you. So there was a question from Islamabad on the role of the media and civil society. And I think what we are trying to do here is promoting that discussion and uh, Unidir and uh, the Harvard University and others are also writing on this issue. So I think there's an important role here, uh, but I think one should encourage the media and uh, researchers and all nuclear weapon possessor states to write more openly on this and in some states, they should be given the freedom 
to express their views openly and not be subjected to official thinking as unfortunately happens in, in some of the nuclear armed states. Um, coming back, um, you know, all of these nuclear risk reduction measures like the nuclear accidents agreement uh, to reduce the outbreak of nuclear war, uh, prevention of incidents at sea, uh, prevention of nuclear war, uh, prevention of dangerous military activities, notification of missile launches, nuclear risk reduction centers, uh, etc., are there, but they're, they're not mentioned in the current discussion. And in the in the papers put out by NPDI, Stockholm Initiative, and others, it seems that they are starting from a blank page of paper. And so, how how do we explain this? Uh, we do have a rich history of various measures, some of which are being implemented, some of which are being ignored. Uh, but if many of the older mes uh, measures were in fact implemented and we could add on that, we might be in a better position. So Francesca, how about starting with you? No, you are absolutely right, Tarek. And in fact, let me say, so one thing we have, we have uh, started doing actually at Harvard, we have a project now called Data for Deterrence which doesn't necessarily mean um, supporting deterrence, but what it means is we need to understand how near miss uh, you know, crisis led in fact to nuclear learning. And there have been, especially between the Soviet Union and the United States, I'd love to hear also what Andre uh, think about this, but there have been serious, uh, serious progress in terms of understanding you know, way, where we could miscalculate, where we somehow, you know, we needed more uh, communication uh, and more connections. So in a way, crises have been used in the past to actually produce uh, nuclear learning and some, some of the practices, right? Some of the common practices have in fact been internalized, particularly when it comes to nuclear safety of the arsenal in particular, we've done a lot of uh, important progress. But the issue for me, uh, Tarek, and I go back to what uh, um, uh, Alex has said, to me today, something very fundamental in the game of deterrence has changed. You know, we think about deterrence, nuclear deterrence, uh, you know, from when we, we think about today, nuclear deterrence, we think about, well, you know, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. I think instead the game of nuclear deterrence has almost gone back to the 50s. And this is where is ground zero now. There are no guardrails, there are no principles of the game, right? And increasingly nuclear weapon states have come to believe that the only credible deterrent system is by increasing the credibility of the threat, right? And so the restraint that somehow, you know, the 60s and the 70s brought, right? This idea of, you know, damage limitation, even the question of mutual assured destruction, this idea of vulnerability that would allow somehow a more reciprocal stability has gone out of the window. And the idea today is escalation as the motto, because escalation will lead to more stability. I mean, this is, this is insane, but I think this is exactly what Alexander is picking up on. And ultimately, let's remember the school of thought, right? Thomas Schelling famously once said that the most successful threats are the ones that don't have to be carried out. Mm -hmm. So the manipulation of risk ultimately is the game of the tenants. And so you are asking nuclear weapon states, now let's remember, not even in a peacetime, right? So in a risk, in a peacetime, risk reduction and deterrence can coexist, but you are not in a peacetime, right? You are in a crisis at best and a war at worst. And so in, the, in, the, in wartime, deterrence cannot rely on restraint precisely because you are in a wartime. And so you are asking nuclear weapon states right now to become responsible, restraining themselves, when the game of the tenants tells you escalation, escalation, escalation. That's why a risk reduction to me, in a very philosophical way, does not somehow match the historical moment we are in. And that's why I prefer to talk it in crisis management. There is no reduction here when you are in a wartime. Yeah, but, and, uh, but you know, Francesca, you're right. But you know, the, these measures that I listed were not in isolation. We had the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the SALT agreements, the INF agreement. Uh, and then on the conventional side, we had the Helsinki Final Act as well on confidence building measures and also on dealing with nuclear disarmament. So there was, they made the integral link between making nuclear weapons sort of, sort of safe and to reduce the risk, but there was adding to it by building the structure Absolutely. An architecture of which we are not doing. We're only talking about nuclear risk reduction. 
And the TPNW folks are trying to build a new architecture, but they are being opposed. Uh, and in the NPT, it's all nuclear risk reduction. And when you talk to them about this link, people look at you as if you've gone funny. Uh, part of the reason is that most of this new generation of diplomats have no clue what happened before. And so they think they're being very smart by coming up with these new measures on a blank piece of paper. And then when you talk to them, uh, and people like you uh, lecture to them, they, have, they don't understand where they're, they're going or where they're coming from. So uh, we're running out of time. Um, so, um, you know, people are worried about artificial intelligence taking over and becoming smarter than us. So there is this new tool that came out, Chat uh, GPT AI. So I asked Chat GTP AI to tell me what is nuclear risk reduction and what is strategic risk reduction. And I got sort of very interesting answers. So Chat GPT AI said that nuclear risk reduction is based on three objectives, arms control agreements, confidence building measures, and crisis management mechanisms. And Chat GPT AI said that strategic risk reduction is based on diplomatic engagements, military to military communications, and norms and rules. So I'd like each one of you to give me your reactions to this, and these would be the final comments, and then we will wrap up after that. So uh, let's start with Alexander. Gosh, you put me on the wrong foot here. <laughs> can, can, can you ask someone else first? I need to think Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to give Francesca the last word coming from academia, so I'll, I'll give it to Andre next. I think it's a great example of why we're not going to lose our jobs anytime soon <laughs> because ChatGPT doesn't know what it's talking about. <laughs> I think there there is some truth in there. You're also right at the moment it doesn't, but I think the three objectives that it stated, I haven't seen them stated by real life diplomats that way. So I think in that sense it's an aggregation of information. So it's not intelligence, it's not doing our thinking. It's drawing from the body of information out there and packaging it in, in one way. And so it doesn't mean we need to be slaves of this, but I think um, there are some new tools that we could look at more creatively. So do you have any um, last comments in 30 seconds, Andre? We, we need nuclear risk production. I still believe we need nuclear risk production. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, we get the vote from Unity or a nuclear risk reduction. Alexander? On the, on the, on the artificial intelligence uh, uh, question, I will, I will give you an evasive answer, saying that rather than commenting on what ChatGPT has to say about risk reduction, I'm much more concerned about uh, the role artificial intelligence uh, can play in the nuclear weapons uh, domain um, uh, and I think that is one of the very big issues which actually gives great pause of thought also for people who are very strongly supportive of nuclear deterrence. So new technologies, uh, specifically artificial intelligence, also uh, cyber vulnerabilities among others greatly add to nuclear risks uh, and, and, and rather than um, conceptualizing it in a way of how can we integrate these new technologies into our deterrence thinking, I think is even more of a reason to challenge the assumptions on which nuclear deterrence are based, uh, given these added risks. And on the sort of final, final comment, um, someone just mentioned before the, the sort of responsibility issue. I think that's a very interesting one that we see uh, specifically since uh, President Putin's nuclear threats, uh, um, a way of framing the discussion between irresponsible behavior of nuclear weapon states and responsible behavior of, of nuclear weapon states. And I think that is, that's again, that is a very important discussion uh, that goes back to the um, fundamental issue of risks stemming from nuclear deterrence practices uh, or not. There can be responsible behavior and irresponsible behavior within the nuclear deterrence paradigm. But the discussion that we need to uh, have is whether the nuclear deterrence paradigm is responsible or not. Thank you. Thank you. So Francesco, over to you, last word from academia. I think now the dis discussion on deterrence and nuclear weapons has been democratized. 
And I believe there is more expertise available in academia than in international organizations or in, in foreign ministries. They may have more experience in negotiating, but I think with the broader thinking, learning from history, imagining new worlds is still very much in academia. And so your final comments, Francesca, maybe you could say a few words about this new project of yours, which I think is on reframing this entire discussion. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Tarek. You're always so supportive. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm leading at, at the Harvard Kennedy School, this uh, big uh, new research project is a research network composed by various universities and think tanks called a uh, research network on rethinking nuclear deterrence. And in a way, you really somehow looks at deterrence and disarmament in a continuum. And so we believe that, yes, uh, there are risks, they have to be addressed. But at the end of the day, in order to make progress, we also need to to outline a very clear path towards a world without nuclear weapons. And, you know, whether we think about this in conventional ways where we try to learn from no nuclear weapon states that are not under a nuclear alliance, and yet they feel that they are secure in their own region. So I think there's a lot of learning that needs to be done internationally, historically, you know, across disciplines. And the idea here really is that one institution in one country is not going to cut it today. That we really need to break down the silos and we need somehow to challenge assumption. And I want to connect it to your artificial intelligence question. I mean, to me, what artificial intelligence does is questioning one of the most important assumptions we've always made about nuclear weapons in the nuclear age. That is, humans will always remain in charge of the control mm -hmm. of nuclear weapons. This is no longer an assumption we can make and we should make. And so this new technology should not only be somehow considered as critical, important, or destructive, but should really push the boundaries of what we believe it's true today. Are we making the real assumptions? Are we made just lazy assumptions because we have inherited these assumptions? What new assumptions should we make? So this is, to me, is the moment in time where it's really important to push the boundaries of what we think it's true by not be... Uh, my, my, might not be longer um, real. And then let me finish with this. I actually think that yes, learning is important, but to me to get out of this mess, we need more than just learning. And in fact, we need more than just knowledge. I think we need to open an age of real wisdom. And real wisdom doesn't necessarily only come out because we have the real facts and the real you know, historical you know, analysis. But it's also because we look at these cases that we try to understand them through value lenses. And we need to bring back at some point, Tarek, the courage to talk about ethical issues. Because exactly. for, some, mm -hmm. for some reasons, we have just you know, tried to sanitize the discussions when there are real you know, right and wrong questions that need to be addressed. And so looking through the normative answers, in my view, we can actually really achieve more wisdom and maybe, you know, coupled with good knowledge, we can actually get out of this. Thank you. I think you raised these very important points about wisdom, about ethical issues. And more and more, as we rely on these new technologies, people's attention span is being reduced. With Twitter and FaceTime, people don't read books anymore. Uh, even in universities, the focus of learning is, is changing in a way. So I'd like to, uh, this is a very big discussion. We only touched the surface of it. I'd like to apologize to those uh, questionnaires whose, to whose questions we couldn't get to. Uh, and as we can see, we had a rich discussion. So I'd like to thank, of course, Francesca, Alexander, and Andre, and also to the participants, and pass the floor back to uh, Benedict Zanzinger at the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. Well, thank you very much, Tariq. Thanks for this excellent moderation. And I would like to thank our speakers, Ms. Giovannini. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Quent. And greetings to Geneva. Thank you, Mr. Paklitsky. I would also like to thank audience from around the world for your unbroken interest, for your numerous questions and comments today. Please visit the website of the Multilateral Dialogue as well as Atomic Reporters to watch previous videos on the topics of, for example, the NPT Review Conference, the PrepCom 1, and Naval Nuclear Propulsion, as AUKUS has been mentioned. I wish you a pleasant evening or a rest of the day, and I'm looking forward to see you on the next online briefing. Keep safe and goodbye. Thank you.